to Melanie Windridge, a physicist and mountaineer. I'm climbing Everest and I want to look at the science that gets us to the summit. Today, I'm talking to David Spiegelhalter about risk. What is risk? I like to think that risk is both, can be both positive and or negative. You know, you just don't know how something's going to happen. It might work out well for you, it might not. And when you take a risk, you're walking into the unknown. Why is it important to have an understanding of, of risk? We want to know an idea of magnitude. We all take risks and we need to take risks. Risks are great, I love <laughs> taking risks. The crucial thing is not to be reckless. And we can only know the difference between those if we've got some idea of, of, of magnitude. So how do we get an idea of magnitude? We have to you know, be in tune with our emotions about what feels right and what doesn't. But I'm a statistician, of course. I also think we've got to look at the numbers. By looking at the data, we can get some idea of the magnitude. And can you give us an idea of how dangerous Everest is compared to other things? Yeah. Somebody invented a unit, it wasn't me, uh, what's called a, it sounds like a micromort. A micromort is a one in a million chance of getting killed at something. And it's a very good baseline because in fact, out of you know, 50 million people in England and Wales each, each day, uh, 50 die a, a non-natural cause of death. Their death comes suddenly. So that's about one in a million. So on average, it's about a daily dose of, of danger, of risk. A daily dose. And some people it's higher and some people it's lower. But that's roughly, it's a day's worth. And so you can measure by looking at, for example, how, uh, how many people get killed motorcycling, for example, you, know, you get about six or seven miles for a micromort on a bike, which is not very much. Whereas you get about 250, 300 miles in a car and 7,000 miles on a train or a plane or something like that. And so it's a very useful unit for comparing things. Shall we look at Everest? Yeah. Okay, okay. the data on Everest, it looks like about a one and a half percent chance, if you leave base camp, of not getting back on average. So there's one and a half out of hundred. So that out of 200 people leaving base camp, three, sorry, yeah, three don't get back. Yeah. Okay, so one of, that's actually <laughs> 15,000 micromorts. That's a lot of micromorts. That's a lot, that is a mm. lot. Mm. I have to say it's a lot. The closest I've got to it is having heart surgery. Oh God, really? Yeah. Open heart surgery for an older person, one or man, is about one and a half percent people die of open heart that's surgery. That's interesting. 15,000 micromorts and it's about seven miles, that's about 100,000 miles on a motorbike. That's, that's a lot. You know, that's four times around the world on a motorbike for heart surgery. If I say it's a 98.5% survival rate, I think, yeah, go for it, cool. So it, it, the way you tell the story and the comparators you make and do you put a positive or a negative gloss on it makes a massive difference to our emotional reaction to it. We tend to think that it won't happen to us, or at least that we have some control over it. And so if I make the right decisions on the mountain, then I will reduce that risk. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you will. And you know, we know we read of things where people have actually made the wrong decisions and done the wrong things and pressed on when they shouldn't and things like that. Um, avalanches are a slightly different matter because you know, to, to a large extent they will be out of your out of your control. Like everybody, you don't want to take risk. You do everything to try to make it safer and, and, and safer. But there is some, always some residual chance of an accident that happening. There's really just nothing. To do. You, can, you can't do anything about the weather. The other thing people will say then is like, why would you take that risk? Why would you take that chance? It's a chance to do something and to give something a go. And you might make it, you might not. But whatever happens, this is what I say. I talk to kids quite a lot about taking risks. And I say, as long as you're not reckless, take the risk. Because even if it doesn't work out, you will have learned something. You will at least have tried. You've got that experience. You won't be, you know, go on getting older thinking, oh, I wish I'd tried that. Why people do things is very complex. Frankly, it's not my job. <laughs> Beyond my pay grade, say why people, I don't know why people, but anyone does anything. I'm going to be asking someone about I that a bit later I, on. <laughs> I need to talk to someone who does know about why, why people do things. Well, I've been talking to David Spiegelhalter about the risks of Everest. Right. And so I was wondering, considering it's so risky, why do people choose to climb mountains? It typically tends to be people who are extroverts. Some people love to seek sensation and, and sort of get their drilling going, get excited about things. But tied to that is also a sense of accomplishment. So for some people it's a goal. They like setting high goals, ambitious goals and achieving. Some people take risks because it's um, the norm within their friend group, whereas with other people um, the norm is not to take the risks. I enjoy lots of different aspects of climbing, from the planning of a climb to the, the skill involved with climbing 
to the mountain environment and being in the mountain environment and the wildlife and nature that you see on the way and the mountain landscapes that you travel through. I do it really for enjoyment. I like the views, I like the experience, I like the challenge up to a point. Um, and I like doing things new. I particularly like exploratory mountaineering. Do you think they might just think that it won't happen to them, that they'll be okay? Yes, in fact, uh, so-called optimism bias uh, is a crucial aspect of, uh, um, of, of human existence. In fact, we tend to think that uh, we're going to be better off than other people, that we're not as susceptible to risks. How do people make decisions about whether to do something that has a risk associated with it? There's a few factors that are really crucial in risk-taking, and there's a few biases, as we call them, because we all suffer from them. One is overconfidence, so that can result in unwise decisions sometimes, when you feel very confident, but in reality, you know, you lack certain accuracy with which you make certain decisions that can turn out uh, unfavorably. Most things that are exciting have got some degree of risk associated with them. I try to keep it down to a minimum. I think you just have to make an assessment of whether the risk is tolerable for you and your friends that you're with or not. And uh, that's a judgment call, really. I don't think anyone would go to Everest, for example, if they thought they were going to die. We think, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay. Like, you just wouldn't go otherwise. Right. If you think about it, is there anyone who would go and say, well, yeah, I could, I could die on this trip. That's very likely. I'm very rational about it. You know, I've done, I'm not, I'm not overly optimistic. There's a pretty good chance I could die and, and then still do it, right? That's pretty rare. But maybe to some extent, if we didn't have this optimism bias and slight overconfidence, maybe we wouldn't achieve some of the great things that we have uh, as, a, as a species. You've got to assess that risk. Um, different people assess it in different ways. I think I'm fairly safe. <laughs> Some kinds of climbing, I believe the risk is probably about as much as, as doing DIY at home. But there's other sorts of climbing where, the, where there is high risk involved. And, um, and that's something that you have to think about as a climber. Are there ways that I could reduce my risk or make better decisions when I'm actually on the mountain? I think it's important to think about optimism bias, right? How optimistic uh, are you? And how motivated are you? And how confident are you? Those three factors, I think, are, are crucial. Have you overestimated your abilities? Is it more difficult than you've thought? Uh, if that's the case, maybe you should reconsider. Are you staying optimistic uh, despite of several signs that things are not going well? A lot of people feel that's a good trait to have, right? I'm, you know, I'm going through with this, it's, it's a good personality trait. In many situations that's true, but when it comes to possibly life-altering decisions, uh, I think we should try to temper those feelings. Some people tend to climb in groups because they think it's safer to have other people around you, which is true. But one phenomenon that's really robust is what we call the risky shift. Uh, the risky shift is the idea that groups make riskier decisions than any single individual would on their own. When you're in a group, you might feel safer because you're with other people, but you also have to think about, are those group dynamics conducive and adaptive to the situation, or are they making you personally more risky uh, and engage in more risk-seeking behavior than you would have otherwise? And so I think, you know, when you're, when you're up there, trying to keep all of those factors straight is, uh, as I said before, in theory, yes, you know, in practice, hopefully, uh, people can reflect on those things. To do something as incredible as climbing the highest mountain in the world, I have to accept some risk. But I will be doing my utmost to reduce the risks wherever I can.